Neil Tuckett is Mr. Model T, the foremost restorer in Europe. The bug got him when he inherited this old van from his uncle. And soon, he'd given up farming in favor of restoration. Now his workshops turn out about one a week. But the one we're after is so special, it's kept under lock and key. Hey, hey. Look at that. I presume this is the car. This is a unique Model T. Uniquely in need of quite a lot of work, Neil. Yeah, it's unrestored. Oh, what an amazing thing. You can see it all. There's nothing hidden here. But you can also see there's a lot of hard work. Oh, well, that's your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, Claire, what do you find out how much work it needs? Maybe you could tell me a bit more about it, Neil. Everything about this baby is a bit different. This is not a standard Model T Ford engine. It's got overhead valves and a larger air intake, which means it's more efficient and therefore more powerful. Normally on a Model T, you'd expect the wheels to have wooden spokes like a cart, but this one's got metal discs. Very, very strong, very aerodynamic. This car has so much personality. I mean, look at the steering wheel. It's low down, it's mean, it's nasty, it's racing, it's heading forward. So where did Neil pick up this one-off? I found it on a farm in Herefordshire. Um, the old boy had bought Model T's in the 60s and he'd collected this off a farm somewhere nearby. Uh, it was all in bits and boxes. We knew it was something interesting, but we didn't know what. In the early 1990s, um, we'd, we'd worked out what the number plate was on the old radiator, and I saw a picture of it in one of these books. And uh, then we realised it had some racing history. And here it is at uh, Brooklands in 1912. And here's a picture of it. Oh, that's fantastic. With, with the body, and that's when it was known as the Golden Ford. That's really beautiful, isn't it? None of that's left. Unfortunately, the body doesn't seem to have survived. I imagine it was pretty dazzling when it yes, came down. Yes, quite the a sight to see. Claire, come and have a look at this. That rusting hulk in there. Isn't that beautiful? Look at the shine on it. Yeah. Gorgeous, Even isn't it? Even on a black and white photo, you can see all the reflections. All the reflections. Absolutely. That's right. Well, here's the deal, Neil. We think it'd be daft to take it away to get the mechanical restoration done somewhere else, seeing as you're the mechanical expert. But what we thought we would do is take it away and get the lovely bodywork done at a coach builder's. Would that suit you? That sounds good to me. Yeah, does that, that suit you? Yep. Fantastic. Well, yep. that's the deal. You're on. And hopefully, Neil, the next time you see it, it'll be at Brooklyn's racetrack. Oh, excellent. All shiny and beautiful. Well, I'm looking forward to taking it up the test hill. Fantastic. Well, all I've got to do now is go and try and find someone who knows how to build this lovely coach work. Are you off to the library, then? It would seem that way, Claire. Can't keep you out, <laughs> then, can we? <laughs> see you later. Good luck. Bye, then. Our goal is to have the Golden Ford screaming along the famous home banking, what's left of the Brooklyn's racetrack, the world's first purpose-built motor racing circuit. We also want to fulfill Neil's dream of powering her up the famous Brooklyn's Test Hill. Back then, a good time was 7.9 seconds. Quite a challenge for Neil. And if we aren't going to push her up, then Claire and Neil are going to have to sort out her chassis. See how far out it is, Pete. Tune up her engine and attend to a very dodgy rear wheel. And I'm going to have to find some little company who can help us restore her wonderful brass body. This week's challenge takes us to the dawn of the automobile. It's a 1911 Model T Ford. But this one's no black banger, it's the golden Ford. A brass-bodied thoroughbred with a pedigree to prove it. And whilst Claire and her owner, Neil Tuckett, get to grips with what's left of her, I'm out on the road, burdened with questions. Why would the ultimate utilitarian vehicle like the Model T Ford be turned into a racing car? Why was it chosen? And more importantly, what happened to our car, the Golden Ford, to make her what she was? I need to find a historian, somebody who knows about these kind of things. And I think I know where to find one. Right, Neil, I know it's in one hell of a state, but we're going to start... Back in the workshop, and Neil and I are thinking about sparking her up. It sounds like absolute madness, doesn't it? But it does work. These things are so simple that if you put a battery on it, fire to it, it sometimes works. Right, you jack the back wheel up, because yeah. that makes life easier. Normally, I'd be a bit wary about starting up an engine like this without yeah. first having a good look right, inside. Makes it easier to swing. But Neil's the expert, and it's his engine, so here goes. 
blog. Ah, <laughs> action. <laughs> it wants to go. Yeah. You just hold that about there. Make sure yeah. sort of started, but it isn't exactly environmentally friendly. To make it clean and mean for the pits, we're going to have to rebore the whole engine and tune it up. The rest of the work should be fairly simple. We'll need to check that the chassis is okay. Replace the spoked front wheels with discs like those she had in 1913. Luckily, Neil's got two lying around. But the tyres are ancient, so a new set will need to be made. And then, of course, there's that wonderful brass body, a brilliant mix of sexy good looks and true Grand Prix aerodynamics. This is one of my favourite bits of restoration, taking it apart. You don't know what you're going to find or if it's ever going to go back together again. But one very, very small spanner, one very, very big spanner. It's got to fit somewhere. Oh. There it goes, one radiator. Made that look easy. Once upon a time, this car would have been a bog standard Model T. But almost a hundred years ago, someone did one of the world's first custom jobs on her and rather conveniently left their calling card. You've just got to keep your eyes open when you're taking these things apart. George and Jobling, Newcastle Fontaine builders. All these clues to its past. So what did George and Jobling do to turn a standard Model T into a racing car? First, they got rid of the bodywork and the rear seat. They removed the old petrol tank and dropped the driver's seat back along the body and stuck it low over the centre line. Down went the steering wheel to where the driver could reach it and the pedals got shifted to the right. A small petrol tank was put between the steering wheel and the engine. The engine was beefed up with overhead valves and anything else they could think of and they got rid of the spoked wheels and fitted solid discs. Finally, they added that super sexy body and the Model T became a racing car. The only thing that remained standard are the brakes, which were next to useless on the road and positively deadly on the track. So with the car in bits, we have the beginnings of her history. She was made by a bunch called George and Jobling up in Newcastle upon Tyne. But who drove her all those years ago? To find out, I'm heading right to the birthplace of motor racing, what's left of the Brooklyn circuit in deepest Surrey. While Henry Ford was designing the Model T, across the pond in the UK, the British were building the world's first purpose-built racetrack. On July 6, 1907, the first race was started at the new track, and it marked the start of a golden era of motorsport. It had taken nine months to build and cost over £150,000, a small fortune at the turn of the century. And this is it. Over the next 30 years, records would be set and broken, and this track would become synonymous with motoring success. At three and a quarter miles in length, with two huge banks 30 feet high, motor racing soon caught the public's imagination. And the brave young chaps who took to the circuit soon became household names. Fame and fortune, not to mention women, followed them on and off the track. Deep in the archives, I discovered that the driver and owner of our car was a chap called A.E. George. One half of George and Jobling, who owned a Ford dealership up in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. It's right here that 90 years ago, A.E. George and his fearless chums tuned their cars into fearsome racing machines before taking their lives in their hands over there on the hallowed track. But what was a Geordie car salesman doing risking life and limb on the Brooklyn's banks? I'm hoping motor racing historian David Burgess Wise knows the answer. The people who came down here were the pioneers, brave men who wanted to go faster than anybody else, and the dealers who came down here, people like A.E. George, they had something to prove. Perhaps more than the wealthy amateur, they wanted to show that their make of car was the best. So that's where the phrase, win on Sunday, sell on Monday came from. Exactly. And racing a Model T Ford, I can tell you, is a pretty dangerous pastime. 
but this is how the Ford first appeared at Brooklands, just a strip chassis. Uh, George, being a motor trader, knew the easiest way of making a car go quickly was just to throw the body away. It's so that's just what he did. One seat, and in fact he made it so light that he had to put a piece of pig iron over the back axle to keep the wheels on the track. So really it was nothing but a giant pram with an engine. Well, exactly. And if you look Then at in the 1913, George covered up the pram with its super sexy brass body. But why? Wheels. It's the only racing car I've ever heard of that had a polished brass body. And I suspect it was done for publicity rather than any increased performance. Because obviously, among all the aluminium and painted cars, a polished brass car would have stood out like a ray of sunlight. The cars might go faster today, but so much else is the same. Even at the dawn of motor racing, the whole thing was about getting your car seen. So the common punter would come and park with the readies down at the dealership. But standing out from the crowd wasn't just a matter of a brass body. You had to win. And to do that, you need to beef up the engine, which explains my trip up north to engine specialist Cottrells, who've been giving our engine the full McLaren treatment. Every bearing's been coated in white metal and remachined, and each cylinder rebored. When it fires up next time, not only will it be as good as new, it will be as powerful as when A.E. George raced her at Brooklands 90 years ago. But when I got back to the workshop, all was not well. Neil and his assistant Peter had discovered a problem with the chassis, which could literally knock us off track. We've got a hump, we've got a, well, we've got a dip here where the engine sits, so we've got to get that uh, out, and we've got to get rid of this twist. It's not surprising that the chassis has a bend or two. The banking at Brooklands was an unforgiving place, and with brakes little better than a bicycle's, a prang or two was inevitable. But what's the best way to fix a race-bent Ford chassis? Simply flatten it with another Model T. Right. Yeah. You're not really going to drop the car on it, are I you? I am, honestly. The only way we don't want to straight. We don't want to fix two right, Model Ts. Yeah, somewhere there. Good point. Somewhere about there. Right, happy with that? No. no. <laughs> Nervous. Doubting me. It'll work, have faith. Are you absolutely sure? Coming down slower. Tap. Inch. Right, go oh. for it. Touching now. Right. You can see it bending. <laughs> this is the great thing about the Model T. It is so simple. This chassis may look like a bed frame, but it's made of high-tech metal. If we've managed to straighten it, it will be the only thing keeping the car together at speeds of over 75 miles per hour. Level along the top now. All right, that's pretty good. That side's not bad either. Is this my present? Ah, oh, yes, here it is. Oh, brilliant. With the chassis flattened, we can turn our attention to our reconditioned engine, a three-litre brute of a thing. Ready? The original Model T engine was designed as a plodder, but by changing it to overhead valves, A. George was able to get the fuel in and the exhaust out much faster. The result, more revs and more power. How so, much more power? Um, I think we're about 45, 50 horsepower instead of 22. You doubled yeah. it. Also, the compression so, ratio has increased at the same time. So on that little tiny flimsy car, yeah. Yeah, he's doubled the amount of power. Yeah. It must have just Wait. shot along. Oh, it was. It's very quick. Can you imagine turning up? Everybody else is there with all their cars. And you turn up with what they think is a Model T Ford. And then someone spots the overhead valves. Yes. Yes. But, uh, there must have been people at the start line yeah. not knowing where to put their money. No, that's right. 